All right, mic check, peace and blessings, everyone. Can y'all give me some thumbs up if you can hear me okay? Boom. Good, all right, welcome to Ask a Sister Farmer, the special Juneteenth edition, episode number 12. And for those of you who've been with us, you know that we are all about to free ourselves, we must feed ourselves. We are building on the legacy of our ancestral grandmothers who braided seeds and promise into their hair before being forced to board transatlantic slave ships, believing against odds in a future of tilling and reaping on the land and believing that we, their descendants, would exist to inherit that seed, to carry that forward. So honored and excited to be collaborating with the Hunger for Justice series all day today. We had some amazing, badass Black presenters all day and more coming up, so definitely stay tuned. And the theme of today's Ask a Sister Farmer is the plants of Black freedom. So I am joined today by my most wonderful, dynamic, beautiful womb sister, Naima Peniman, right here. Mm-hmm. And um, together, we are going to collaborate um, to tell you some wonderful stories about the plants of Black freedom. Uh, we are broadcasting today from Soul Fire Farm, Mohican Territory, Rensselaer County. I'm Leah Peniman. My pronouns are Lee, she, ya, and Eye, and I'm going to hand it over to the wonderful Naima to introduce themselves as well. <laughs> Greetings, Sam, and celebrations to all the freedom fighters out there. My name is Naima Peniman. I use all pronouns, and I'm proud to serve as program director here at Soul Fire Farm and be a steward of Wild Sea Community Farm, and here representing Black freedom and queer liberation. All right, family. So today uh, for my tip, I wanna talk to you a little bit about a couple of plants that are part of our black freedom struggle. And for this, we need to go back, back, back before Juneteenth um, to one of the older freedom struggles which took place on the island of our ancestral mothers, which is Aiti, Haiti, the land of mountains, right? And so for folks who don't know, um, slavery in Haiti was of a particularly brutal uh, archetype, let's just say. They had figured out, the French enslavers had figured out that it was actually more profitable to kidnap and import new bodies from Africa than it was to allow people the conditions to live long enough to have children. So the life expectancy on average in Haiti was 21 years old. I'm just going to think about that. 21 years old was the life expectancy. So these are the conditions that one of our ancestors found himself in as one of the 12 and a half million people who was kidnapped and and forced to work. And this ancestor's name was Makandal. Now Makandal um, was just a powerful being. I mean, by the time he came to Haiti, was already fluent in Arabic, had deep, deep botanical knowledge. And he got um, you know, onto the plantation in Hispaniola and was resisting from jump, you know, was doing work stoppages, was organizing protests, had escaped many times out into the mountains to join the Maroon community. And um, many times he was caught. And one time they even attempted to, and he escaped from that and in the escape actually lost an arm. So he was living his life. Um, with one arm going back and forth between escape and and bondage. He managed to amass an army together with his comrade, partner in crime, crime, Mama Brigitte. They amassed an army of 50,000 warriors, people who were resisting slavery, and they didn't have any weapons. They tried to get some guns, you know, from the higher class, uh, what they called mulats, and they refused to get them guns. So they didn't have anything. All they had was their knowledge of plants, right? And what they organized, and so we're talking about the plants of Black freedom, right? What they organized was essentially a mass poisoning in order to win their liberation. And some of the plants that were involved in the compound, right, included the ackee fruit, because the unripened ackee fruit causes uh, what we sometimes call Jamaican vomiting sicknesses, which, which can lead to coma and death. Um, they use the velvet bean, they use the black nightshade, they use the sasswood or muavi. And they went against these people who had been, um, and trigger warning, because this is torture we're talking about, like these enslaved people had been subject to 
being drowned in sex. They've been subject to being rolled down hills and barrels studded with spikes. They've been subject to being boiled alive in cane syrup. I mean, these are the conditions. And they coordinated on one night an attack of thousands. And it so upended the system. It so upended the structure, this powerful resistance based on plant, plant power, you know, that um, the enslavers were trying to put out laws banning folk medicine. They were trying to put out laws banning night gatherings, but this just continued, continued. And eventually after many years of this, the enslavers did manage to capture Mama Brigitte and Mackenzie and burn them at the stake. And witnesses say that when those flames reached up towards our ancestors, Mackenzie turned into a mosquito and escaped, pledging revenge, saying, I'm gonna come back in one generation and I'm gonna finish this fight. Uh, Mama Brigitte became a Lua or like an Orisha, right? And so she lives with us in our worship today. And true, true to his word, Mackenzie, one generation later, 1791, is showing up, bringing some yellow fever. And I will tell you why that matters. Because August 1791, right, our ancestors get together at Bwakaima to start to plan for the revolution. They said, enough is enough. We would rather die than continue in these um, conditions. They called on all their gods from all their regions, from all their lineages. They made their offerings, their sacrifices, their prayers, and they pledged a pact like we are going to fight mm -hmm. until we are free or until we have transitioned to the ancestor realm. And there was another plant that helped them out. And this is what I brought with me today. So this plant is called basil. It is the king of herbs. Mm. Basil is the king of herbs. They actually used an African blue spice basil. This here is a Prospera. Um, basil that used for pesto, but similar properties. So they had this basil plant with them and of the many, many things that basil does, right? We know it reduces anxiety. We know it helps with digestion, et cetera. But basil is powerful for increasing your eyesight and clearing up eye conditions. So both a tea taken of the basil as well as a tea, a tea that washes the eyes will help you to see better at night. Mm -hmm. And mind you, our ancestors, these revolutionaries, they were, organizing at night. They were fighting at night. So they were using the basil in order to fortify their eyesight and in order to reduce their anxiety, increase their strength and commitment. And, you know, it took a bunch of years. It took till 1804. But indeed, indeed, um, this bunch of people who were armed with just fire and plants eventually conquered the most powerful army in the world at the time, which was the French army, Napoleon's army. They were later attacked by the Spanish and the British. They defeated them too. And they formed a free black republic that had outlawed slavery in its constitution. Mm -hmm. This inspired over 500 uprisings of enslaved people around the world, right? And so we are so excited um, to be celebrating Juneteenth, to be celebrating 1804 to be celebrating black liberation and the role that plants has. Now, just a little bit more on my tip. If you do want to grow basil and use it for its medicinal purposes, it's very good to make it into a tea. So the steps in making basil into a tea is that you're going to take this basil and then dry it. So what I do is I hang my herbs in a bunch upside down. I have some string, you know, I'm looking at some right now on my ceiling. And so I hang it upside down until it's dry and crispy, right? And then the next step that I'm gonna do is called garbling. So you get a screen like this, and you rub the herb across the top of the screen so that it presses down through the holes, and that allows um, you to have more surface area on your herb, which is better for tea, and it also packs easier, easier to work with. And then finally, you're gonna store the herb in uh, a cool dark place and so I just put it in the pantry inside of a mason jar but in a dark pantry um, and it can keep for at least a year sometimes several years and um, just a teaspoon per cup of water you know you can fortify yourself with that same power that the ancestors used for the revolution so that's my tip that's yes. what I have to say about the plants of black freedom right now and now I'm going to turn it over to my woman soul sister Naima who is going to give you another tip about the plants of black freedom Wow, Leah, thank you so much for that thick and inspiring history lesson. Um, just in awe of our ancestors, gives me so much fortitude um, to remember what they went through and overcame and to know that we still got plant allies to work with nowadays. Um, 
So peace and welcome to anyone who's just joining. My name is Naima Peniman. Um, Lee and I are siblings, a year apart, not twins. A lot of people are asking, and we're here um, at Soulfire Farm, which is Stockbridge, Muncie, Mohican territory in upstate New York. Um, and so honored to be sharing about the plants of Black freedom. And I want to expand our thinking about plants to also encompass the plants of queer liberation, thinking about how botany is such an incredible and powerful reflection of our multi-gendered universe. Um, and I, I think this is really critical to the conversation about Black liberation, so include this conversation of, of gender and queerness. And like I say, as, as people who do not conform to the, the binary that limits gender to two categories, gender expressions to either male or female, we are often told that we are not normal, that we are not natural, that somehow we are an abnormality to nature. And I'd like to challenge that notion entirely by looking at our plant allies and also really looking at, um, at our cultures before colonial imposition um, and our Afro-Indigenous cultures that have always had multiple genders and celebrated multiple genders. Um, so first looking at the plants, right? And um, shout out to Interlocking Roots, which is a network of queer, trans, Black, Indigenous, POC farmers and foodies and earth stewards who engage in food and land work um, as a form of decolonization and anti-oppression. They created this incredible um, zine called Queer Botany, which is also a coloring book. And I'm gonna be sharing some, some facts from that. Y'all can check it out. So. When we think about like the gender or sex of plants, um, we're thinking about like what can be seen as the femme part of the plant, like the seed fruit producing, um, and then the, the pollen producing, which would be scientifically seen as the, mas the masculine part of the plant, right? Um, so 75%, the vast majority of all plants hold both these femme and masculine parts, right? There's um, these two terms, dioecious, and manishas that refer to plant reproduction. And Daisha describes a plant that includes distinct male and female parts, whereas manishas would be a single plant that bears both the male flower and the female flower, right? Um, but the thing is that the gender lines of plants are not always distinct. And um, that's why I think it's so inspiring to see that, um, that there are many plants even that um, have distinct male and female parts that within the course of a day or a lifetime will change gender, as they would say. Like for example, avocado flowers, um, they can shift gender expressions. One moment they'll, they'll open in a femme form as in fruit, fruit producing, and then they'll close and reopen later the same day um, in a masculine form with pollen, pollen producing um, elements. Um, there are other plants that um, if they're under stress, will will change those gender expressions, um, you know, as an effort to reproduce when under stressful conditions turn from that pollen producing um, to a seed and fruit producing at the end of a life cycle. Um, and flowers are perfect examples. The vast majority of flowers share this quality. 90% of flowers hold both the, um, the seed and the pollen, right? And scientists call these perfect flowers, which I think should be a reflection um, to those of us who hold multiple genders. <laughs> um, and I'll just mention one more, the rose flower, um, carrying both seed and pollen producing parts. So there are intersex plant friends and um, they don't need other plants to give or receive pollen or to reproduce. And this is not just limited to the, the plant, kingdom. In the animal kingdom, we have leopard slugs, bonobo monkeys, penguins, dolphins, oysters, um, so many more um, that also are, can be seen as we humans think of as like queer, intersex, or transgender. But as we move on to humans, um, I really want to highlight how in many of our African and indigenous, indigenous pre-colonial worldviews, um, non-binary people, gay and trans, have a very sacred and vital role in society. Um, in the Dagada society in West Africa, gay people are called Bodeme, 
and they function in the community as in a role of gatekeeping and helping to really create a container for a ritual space and bridge between the ancestral realm and the earthly realm. Um, there's also um, throughout the um, throughout the diaspora and in Yoruba cosmology, when we think about um, the supreme being of Odulumare, um, like the wholeness of of creation, um, there's a divine energy and power that is genderless or possesses all possible gender expressions. These, um, this deity holds no gender, um, and that is translated into like those who are the keepers of of tradition and spirituality. Um, I want to just point out like the Lubada people and the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda are among those in Central Africa whose spiritual ceremonies are conducted with transgender priests. Um, similarly, the Zulu of South Africa um, initiate transgender shamans and also in Angola um, in the Ambo tribe, um, similarly as well. Um, so I wonder what has happened in, in our society um, that designates sex at birth and those who transgress this rigid law of the gender binary are the ones who, instead of being revered and respected as in so many other cultures, and I just, will just mention quickly, Rhea, our neighbor here, like speaks of, you know, when somebody comes out as, they don't say transgender in their culture, but, um, but essentially possessing like multi-spirited gender, it is a celebration, it's a reverie, mm -hmm. it's like people come out on the streets and, and celebrate, it's like such a sacred and special position to hold in society. Um, and then when I, when I think about what is going on, like in our nation and other parts of the world where there's been a real deep degradation of um, transgender siblings um, who are the most vulnerable to violence and joblessness, lack of access to healthcare, um, experiencing like childhood domestic violence at such high rates and housing insecurity, over policing, incarceration, like, you know, what has, what has really gone wrong here? Um, and that's why I feel this conversation is so important to the struggle for Black liberation and all Black lives being censored, um, because just within the span of this last week, we lost another two precious mm -hmm. Black transgender women who were, who were brutally killed. I'm speaking of sacred Dominique Remy Fells and sacred Rhea Milton. Um, and again, I'm speaking to just the last week. And already this year alone, there's been 15 documented deaths of trans and gender non-conforming people. Um, and I say at least because too often these stories go unreported. Mm -hmm. um, and the vast majority of these murders, these killings are of black transgender women. Um, but we have also are celebrating a uprising amidst uprisings. I'm so proud that um, Brooklyn, the borough that I've been living in for the past two decades, we had an incredible rally in March for Black Trans Lives called Brooklyn Liberation, um, where nearly um, 12,000 people took to the streets of New York City. No, I'm sorry, 15,000 people took to the streets um, to, to demonstrate and to really support and centralize Black Trans Lives and the struggle for all, um, all Black lives. Um, about a minute? Okay. Um, so yeah, and the, and the goal is really to, um, to expand this global conversation as we're thinking about, uh, as we're talking about Black lives and really demanding a higher standard for our lives and that we have a right to survive and live without fear of violence and murder. We have a right to fresh food and water, housing Actually, and healthcare. Um, um, we're going to put in the chat some organizations to support that are led by incredible um, Black trans community. Um, and it's just really important that we continue to do that. They have, they have been struggling with us. We have been struggling together um, for so long. So. Thank you so much, Naima. <laughs> Um, for that really, really important reminder that the earth, the plants are an example of multiplicitous and inclusive gender understanding and expression. Um, and that to honor that 
means fighting for trans lives um, mm -hmm. because all black lives matter, including black trans lives. And um, we are here today, for those who are just joining, Ask the Sister Farmer. Our theme is Plants of Black Freedom. And we have come to the place in the program where you get to ask your questions. And uh, my son Emmett doesn't like to be on camera, but he's going he's gonna to read off the questions. So it'll be like the voice of God coming in from the <laughs> side. He'll read off the questions, and then we'll do our best to address them um, as we go forward. Um, the first question is, were there other plants that helped with Black freedom? Were there other plants that helped with Black freedom? So many plants. Um, I will tell you one quick story about one plant, um, and it is the cow pea or black eye pea. And among its many wonderful properties, um, the black eye pea has the magical ability to make friends across biological kingdoms. Mm. So the black eyed peas best friend is named rhizobial bacteria. And it basically works like this. Black eyed peas like, hey bacteria, you wanna be homies? And bacteria is like, yes, but on the condition that you make a little home for me in your roots, you fill it up with sugars, you make it real nice and cozy, and then I'll move in. And as an exchange, I can actually inhale nitrogen from the air in its elemental form and just put it into an organic form for you to nourish you. And that is why the soils have nitrogen, right? So what does that do with black freedom? Well, Dr. George Washington Carver in Blessed Memory, who is uh, arguably the founder, um, you know, great granddad of regenerative agriculture in modern times, you know, he's back in the late 1800s trying to build up Tuskegee University, black educational institution, shout out to Tuskegee for so much. And he's looking around and the soils are being treated like the people are being treated. I mean, we're talking about degradation, erosion, uh, the year after year, the crop yield is going down, going down. And he's especially seeing black farmers suffer. Mm -hmm. um, and then they get trapped in this cycle of sharecropping and debt peonage because they can't actually, you know, eke out of the land what they need to for their freedom. And he has this wild idea, you know, he's like, instead of just planting cotton year after year, what if we start rotating in some black eyed peas and some other legumes to replenish the soil? And people are like, Dr. Carver, you're telling me that instead of planting a crop that is going to give me a return, I should plant a crop and then just plow it down under the soil? This makes no sense. So Dr. Carver had to start, you know, quoting the Bible. He was like, God says, Whatever you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. And God was talking about the earthworms, mm. right? So he's preaching. He's getting people converted to soil stewardship. He's getting people converted to composting, to cover cropping, to, um, you know, mulching, to going in the wintertime and mucking out the wetlands and laying it on top of the farms. And in this way, right, he was actually able to support a whole bunch of Black farmers in, in getting enough crops from their restored soils to be able to get land mm -hmm. for themselves, right? And so that little pea, that little black eyed pea in healing the soil became instrumental in the freedom for many black people. So that is one example um, of another plant. And there's many, many more, but I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, People were just wondering, uh, what was the name of the zine you mentioned? Because it seems that the video cut out at that point. Mm. Yeah, a little bit about it. Yeah, so I was talking about the queer botany zine and coloring book called Perfect Flowers. And it was compiled by a collaborative called Interlocking Roots, which is a network of cutie BIPOC farmers and earth stewards. Yeah, definitely check it out. And Naima um, is going to throw that link up in the chat um, if you haven't already seen it. So um, definitely check it out as well as the Black trans-led organizations that you can support in this time as we are celebrating queer Black liberation today. Um, someone was just wondering how they could plant um garlic and small fresh veggies in a small space? This is such an important question because, you know, so many of us are landless right now. You know, 98% of the arable land, the land that can grow food in this country is wide owned. And that is 
no accident of history. We're talking about the genocidal, genocidal theft of land from indigenous people. We're talking about the broken promise of 40 acres and a mule. We're talking about the USDA not giving out loans and supports to black farmers. You know, the white caps and the KKK literally driving black landowners off their lands. We're talking about redlining, we're talking about gentrification, right? So there's a whole system about why this question would come to be of how do I grow something in two square feet, right? right. Which first of all, that's not a fair question. It's not right. a fair question because fundamentally, as Malcolm X talked about, land is the basis of revolution, the basis of freedom, dignity, and equality. And so if we don't own land, right, mm -hmm. we're out of the picture in many ways. And um, so first of all, I wanna say, I will answer your question, I will. But um, you know, it's important for us to organize around land sovereignty and land stewardship. And uh, Soul Fire Farm is one of the founding farms of the Northeast Farmers of Color Land Trust, shout out to all them. And we're working very hard on rematriation of lands to indigenous people, reparations for unpaid wages and exclusion for black and brown folks and, and um, land sharing. Mm -hmm. So, so that nobody has to say, you know, how do I feed my family on my balcony? If they, unless they want to do that, of course. Mm -hmm. All that to say, you can grow quite a bit of food in a small space. Um, the smallest farm I've ever seen is the one that my wonderful sister Naima has going on all the time, which is a jar of sprouts <laughs> uh, right by the kitchen sink. And so, you know, lentils, mung beans, raw sunflower, um, all of these things, alfalfa, broccoli, these seeds can be sprouted. You just put uh, like half inch of seed on the bottom of a mason jar, rinse it out, you know, soak it overnight and then rinse it twice a day with water with a little cheesecloth on the top or, you know, cloth on the top. And in just a few days, you're going to have some amazing sprouts. You want to step that up one more, you know, you can grow salad greens on your windowsill just in pots or old takeout containers. You can have micro greens in 10 days. You can have baby greens in two weeks. Um, and then you want to step it up one from there, uh, you can do container gardening outside. And so things like garlic and carrots, as long as you have at least a three gallon pot, you can fit a few of those. And I'll have, um, in just a moment, I'll throw up Soul Fire Farms gardening guide in the chat. So you can check that out because it has information about container gardening and videos and how to's and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. well, you have the basil plant right there? Yeah, definitely. Just to what show the basil there? again, like a, a quart size container like this which is like a yogurt container is perfect for basil and a lot of other herbs like thyme or cilantro that you'd want to grow just like one plant um which you could do on a windowsill or if you had a terrace or balcony you could do it that way too another question our next question says should gmo seeds and crops be avoided as part of the journey to black liberation on land and can you speak to the importance of ancestral seeds? Um, I have a hard time with the word should because I'm not trying to define anyone's path to liberation, but I will talk about my choices. And my choice is not to use genetically modified seed. And, you know, I am a bi biology major. I love science, so I'm not being anti-progress, anti-modern. But I would say there's a big difference between plant breeding and GMO. Right. So plant breeding is how we have all these amazing varieties that we have. We would not have corn, you know, bigger than an inch if it wasn't for plant breeding. And this is a slow process where you watch the plant over generations. You get to know its characteristics. You notice which plant has that desired color, flavor, size, ripeness, mm -hmm. right? And then you breed that um, over time within the same species until you arrive at that big plump strawberry that extends into July a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Until you have that corn that's perfect for your tortillas. Please, 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 we need more plant breeding. And it's actually a tragedy that we have relegated some of that knowledge to the university mm -hmm. because it used to be that every farmer was involved. You know, mm -hmm. you went from one farm to the next and each one had saved their own seed and had the perfectly adapted variety of melon for their particular side of the mountain, right? Mm -hmm. And I admit, I'm a novice. It's only been a few years that we've been saving seed, but we're taking that really seriously um, because right now seed is totally commodified. Seed is being patented. And when you get into GMOs, sometimes seed is even being inserted with a gene called the terminator gene, which makes it impossible for it to reproduce. So talk about trying to control life in this way that is not what was intended. Mm -hmm. GMO is actually when you take the DNA of a different organism, like a fish, a rabbit, a mouse, right? And then mm -hmm. you stick it into a plant. And the dangers with that is, first of all, uh, precautionary principle. We don't know 
um, what happens over the long term. You've already seen negative impacts, adverse impacts on pollinators, adverse impacts in terms of allergens from people ingesting this food. Not to mention that you're creating something that's trying to beat nature rather than be in mm-hmm. harmony with nature. You're trying to create a plant that makes its own poison to kill off you know, the bugs instead of integrating in some predators to eat the bugs. So I, GMOs are not part of my liberation. <laughs> and definitely um, saving heritage seeds is crucial. Mm-hmm. Shout out to Mama Ira Wallace for um, elder Black woman, Southern Exposure Seeds for teaching us the way with that. And we need more seed keepers. So please, you know, check them out, check out Mama Ira, try to get involved uh, so that we mm-hmm. make sure that we too can pass those seeds down to the next generation. And shout out also to our family in Haiti who said no to GMO seed and GMO rice um, in a really incredible act of resistance and rebellion to some of these seeds. Like I want to say Monsanto has been responsible for a lot of manipulation of seeds so that they terminate after one generation or need a lot of chemical inputs. Um, as a way to create dependency on their products. And in the guise of paternalistic aid, donated a lot of GMO seed to the port of Haiti, but um, our fam knew better and burned that at the port um, and said no to, to such a um, disgusting gift, you know, recognizing that the true power and sovereignty came from, from the, the rice seed um, grown by the Paysan and the farmers movement throughout Haiti. All right, we have time for just one or two more questions. What's it going to be, Emmett? Our last or second last question um, is going to be, are there any other plants in relation to black and brown solidarity worth mentioning today for you guys? Well, hmm. There's many. I'm thinking right now about the relationship that we have with maize across black and brown communities. So um, for folks who don't know, maize is at least, at least, at least 10,000 years old. Um, There's a lot of different legends about its origin, but most connect to it being a gift from the divine mother, from sky woman to indigenous people um, in what is now um, central Mexico. It, uh, from a scientific perspective, you know, Teosinte is its ancestor and it was painstakingly cultivated into the maize we have today. I think it's important to note that uh, there's a lot of evidence that maize actually made it to the continent of Africa before European contact. Mm. And so I've been studying this. I'm a practitioner of the Yoruba religion as well as Vodun. I've been studying with my teacher some of the ancient scripture about maize. And the words for maize predate contact. Wow. They're, they're in the language that is not compatible with the Portuguese having arrived or the English or anything. And maize has become a very central. Um, spirit being uh, in our cosmology as African people um, and diasporic people. And so I think of that as uh, this plant ancestor connection, transcontinental, that helps remind us of the sacred. Um, Maze is considered the mother of life. She is the oldest of the three sisters in the corn beans swa- squash. Uh, sisterhood of of mutual interdependence. Mm. Um, Right now I'm looking out the window over our milpa or maize fields, which we received instructions from the Stockbridge Monte Mohican about particularly which varieties to grow and how to grow them um, because they wanted it done a certain way on their ancestral homelands. And so we have the hills, we have the Mohican uh, black maize and the Mohican uh, yellow maize and the squash around and the beans around all interacting together. And it's actually part of my what's called ita, so during initiation, you receive a particular reading um, about your destiny. And my ita is that I must plant maize every single year for Mm -hmm. my, as long as I'm able in my life. Um, So shout out to the maize. You wanna add anything to that? That's okay. All right, I think we are going to move into some poetry. So, before we, uh, before I turn it over to the wonderful Naima to, to close us out, I just want to say to everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us on Ask the Sister Farmer, Plants of Black Freedom. We are here every Friday 
at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Soul Fire Farms Facebook Live. Every week we have different Black women, trans and non-binary farmers telling you about our projects and more importantly, sharing tips for how you can grow your own food and build up your own food sovereignty. Uh, we are always also accepting more co-hosts. So if you are a Black woman, trans non-binary farmer and you wanna get on here, and tell us um, some of your wisdom. We would be so, so, so grateful. The show is free. We just ask if you're able, please donate to the organizations of the co-hosts because y'all know it's a struggle out there and we gotta mm. support our growers. We gotta support our farmers so we can keep feeding the community. Right. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank yeah. you. And we're gonna go out with some poetry. Yeah. Every patch of earth unencumbered by concrete, where soil and atmosphere meet, be a portal to presence, a terrain of remembrance, a vote for survival in an unpromised future. These gardens are blueprints of interdependent destiny, intergenerational memory, saving seeds for food as remedy. See, my people know what it's like to eat and still be starved. So we turn it hardship into harvest, lawns and schoolyards into gardens, homegrown bounty in our palms. We come from soil and stardust. And so we conjure, giving props to hood magicians who grow provisions for our kitchens. We smuggle spinach into prisons, transform the places that we live in, trade psychosis for symbiosis and stay focused. Sprout sunflowers that towel on neighborhood blocks, harvest raindrops on rooftops that water our crops, propagate plant medicine for the metropolis, guarding our plots, because our gardens are not for profit or loss. Cross pollinate the promise, fam. We got this. Take a deep breath, restore calmness with lemon balm bounty in our palms, sun gold cherry tomatoes in our pockets, sugar snap peas climbing a chain link fence in this oasis of reclamation. We tend havens for justice and sustenance amid glaring disparity. Every seed saved will set us free. In an age of opulence and scarcity, every seed saved will set us free. In a time of intensifying violence and climate calamity, every seed saved will set us free. Hold on tight to the source. We have all that we need. Thank you. Ashish, snaps for that. Thank you so much, Naima. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Leah. Signing off uh, for now, but we'll hopefully see you next week, 4 p.m. Eastern, Friday, for Ask a Sister. Peace. Wow, that was bomb. Bomb. Follow and support these two powerful, powerful, powerful. This is Soul Fire Farms, Wild Seed Community. Um, please, uh, I mean, they touched on a thousand and one things, um, especially with that resiliency part and talking about how um, plants can be part of and are and always should be part of our work that we're doing. Along with the fact that, you know, there was a, a write-up in 2011 that said that if women farmers had the same access to resources as men, the number of hunger in the world would be reduced by up to 150 million. Wow, that's a, that's, that's a huge number, a very, very huge number. Well, right now, once again, thank you, Leah and Naima um, from Soul Fire and Wild City Community. Um, so I've been listening for the last couple of hours and um, I have a part that I want to talk about, and that is food security is national security. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in real quick, and then I'm just going to open up for questions and answers, um, because I think that uh, that is the larger dialogue that I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to talk about and talk with today, if at all possible. Um, so food security is national security. Let's jump right in on that one. So 
you know, if you were to look up online right now um, to find out what food security meant, um, it means that it's kind of funny how it how it's mentioned in here um, is that food security is not just a poverty issue. Um, far from focusing on the needs of the poor in developing countries, um, they are saying that here we go. Food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy lifestyle. Now, what I like about this is that it's saying out loud, it's saying out loud that when we're talking about food security, we're not talking about every community should have kale in it. Y'all ready for this? Not, every, not, not everybody wants to eat those things. That we should be farming culturally appropriate food. Leah, I love the fact that you brought up the fact that maize was in Africa way before anybody ever started thinking about it. Because us as a people, we've traveled the world We've always traveled the world. We knew more about uh, the science of the sea and that the world wasn't flat way before anybody else. Um, so, you know, it just, it's crazy that, to think that when we talk and we say, you know, good, clean and fair food for all and that we need to be concerned with food apartheid, that there's actually laws out there that state that in the United States, we should have food security. Food security for a household means access by all members at all times for enough, for enough food. So when we have these